Hello, and welcome to Power Problems, a podcast from the Cato Institute, where we offer a skeptical take on U.S. foreign policy and discuss some of today's big questions in international security with guests from across the political spectrum. I'm Trevor Thrall, and with me today for a bonus episode of Power Problems are Christopher Preble, the Vice President for Foreign Policy at Cato. Hi, Chris. Hi, Trevor. And John Glazer, the Director of Foreign Policy Studies at Cato. Hello, John. Hello, sir. If you're a foreign policy watcher and you've been having a hard time keeping up with all the news coming out of Washington these days, join the club. There's been a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, there's all the impeachment drama with uh, connections to Ukraine and Australia, China, I don't know, the Vatican, Russia, (laughs) the list goes on. Um, We've been watching uh, the U.S. and Iran play a dangerous game of uh, drone footsies and other things as tensions mount uh, over the nuclear deal there. Uh, We've watched Trump's talks uh, with North Korea end in, I think the word was disgusting failure that North Koreans used. Uh, And then most recently there's been um, just a massive bipartisan uh, revolt at Trump's declaration that he's going to remove U.S. forces from Syria and basically allow Turkey a free pass at the Kurds. It seems like every day there's something making people crazy. And yet, if you, as I think those of us here in the building like to do, if we look below the surface craziness, um, you'll notice that even though Trump himself is an unprecedented sort of person, um, there's still a lot of unfortunate consistency in American foreign policy. I think that's a real puzzle. You know, if only someone had written a book that could provide some deep insight into why Trump behaves this way, and that could help explain why his foreign policies look the way they do. Ah, just kidding. Uh, We did write that book, um, and we're all here today. (laughs) All of us here today. (laughs) We're all here to talk about it. Uh, In addition to being my erstwhile colleagues, John, Chris, and I are the co-authors of a newly published book called Fuel to the Fire, How Trump Made America's Broken Foreign Policy Even Worse and How We Can Recover. Um, so now that I got the title right, um, let's let's just jump into it. And uh, Emma and I usually start by asking people on Power Problems why they wrote their book. Um, and I see no reason not to start there. So guys, why was it time to write this book? What were the goals? I think we needed to take seriously um, the, the possibility that Donald Trump had a point when he said during the course of his campaign that American foreign policy was a disaster and that the American foreign policy establishment had led the country astray. We had to take that seriously, even though we've learned not to take Donald Trump seriously. And and so parsing out the elements of the critique that were valid from the parts of Trump's critique that were Trumpian and therefore irreconcilable and beyond was, I think, really critical. It starts with um, sort of outlining a brief history of recent U.S. foreign policy, at least since the end of the Cold War, and then poking at some of the uh, theoretical and logical flaws underlying primacy, the dominant U.S. national security strategy, which we have all written about before and which it was up to me among, and among the three of us to sort of mash together and reframe as one coherent critique of primacy. Um, so that's that's sort of, and I, and I think that my concern is that people will focus so much attention on Trump himself as a person and because he he just draws attention. It's like moth to the flame. We're all just fixated on this man and his 4.30 a.m. tweets. Um, and my concern is that people will think that we can fix foreign policy by just going back before January 20th, 2017, and all will be okay again. And we will just ignore and just imagine away uh, the Trump presidency. And I think that's a mistake. One of the other major uh, reasons that we found that we needed to write this book is because uh, Trump said a lot of things during the campaign and in his early presidency, and it led observers, many experts that are our sort of colleagues in Washington, D.C. at different think tanks and certain academics, started to try to categorize his views. Uh, he's a realist, or he's a restrainer, or he's an isolationist, or what have you. And we found that that, was, uh, that conversation suffered from a real lack of understanding of each of those terms. Um, and also, uh, you know, it, it, it involved a very selective use of Trump's uh, comments. 
So occasionally he would say things that are consistent, for example, with the restraint view. His emphasis on allied burden sharing, for example, uh, his uh, antipathy or apparent rhetorical antipathy toward uh, regime change uh, or nation building missions. Yeah, these are consistent with many realists and restrainers, but he said many things that contradicted those schools of thought as well. And so we thought it was important to sort of set the record straight because Trump is uh, has a lot of... Um, qualities that you don't necessarily want if you're looking for someone to represent uh, you know, a, a, a school of thought like this. And so we, I think we needed to, to set the record straight on that. Absolutely. And I think you know, just to throw out another, another goal, leading up to the publication of this book over the last few years, there's been a lot of, I think, vigorous debate about US foreign policy post-Trump um, and the liberal international order and what is the right role for the United States moving forward in terms of that. And at the very same time, sort of a side running debate is whether or what the American people are willing to support moving forward. There's, a, there's been a lot of concern, again, some of our colleagues have written about this as well, that maybe public support for internationalism is just dead. Uh, you know, Maybe Trump's America first isolationism is winning. And so another reason for the book is to explore uh, th some of those questions, uh, especially in terms of the public and you know, the chapter that, that I led on on public opinion, you know, thankfully clears up some of those misconceptions. Um, and, you know, Trump's America First vision is woefully unpopular. Um, and, you know, as we come up against the 2020 election, I hope our book can serve as a, a, some kind of a, a, you know, a touchstone for people who think maybe it is time for something different. And, you know, what if we did that, people would actually support it. Absolutely. Right. I think, uh, you know, as critical as we are of Trump in the book, one thing that I think I do have to give him credit for is that he has sort of shaken up the bipartisan consensus on foreign policy. He's such a kind of turbulent uh, force in American politics that he seems to have sort of shaken loose the the hard consensus where now you have really a a, a an engaged elite debate on grand strategy, which just was not happening, I think, in a, in a comprehensive way before Trump. And in fact, part of the reason why that is, is because of the durability and of the bipartisan consensus was the argument had always been made that no one even remotely like Trump could espouse the views that he did and get elected. And, and for a long time, that seemed correct. I mean, George McGovern lost 49 states or something like that. So, so that, you know, the, those sorts of arguments that the United States should be less involved militarily abroad, should call on allies to do more in the past, those adopting those kinds kinds of positions seem to sort of, you know, render a person unelectable. Well, obviously that didn't happen in the case of Donald Trump. He famously criticized a Republican president's war in a Republican primary in South Carolina and won the primary anyway. So it, it did shake, I think, people to their senses and it revealed something that we had all known for some time, which is this undercurrent of dissatisfaction among the American people with the course of US foreign policy. And that undercurrent, though, not having been served in the past by any major political figure and, and Trump, uh, I think in many respects inadvertently or just sort of, sort of fell backwards into it, sort of tapped into this sentiment, which suggests that someone else uh, without all of his baggage and his, his foibles and, and flaws uh, could also tap into that same public sentiment. Yeah. All right. So for those of you listening, I, I won't just give you the whole table of contents, but but just you know, because John and, and Chris sort of touched on different parts, you know, the book opens with essentially an assessment historically of of you know American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War, and some criticisms that we level against uh, liberal hegemony or primacy, if you will. Well, it really starts with a banging introduction. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Don't forget, introduction. Don't forget the really, right. really good introduction. Um, and, and then and then the middle of the book is an assessment of, of Trump, the, the person, the worldview that he holds, and his conduct of foreign policy, wh why it looks the way it does, uh, whether people support it or not. And then the end of the book is a call uh, to kind of rethink uh, the direction of U.S. foreign policy. Um, but uh, I want to 
pivot to talking about Trump himself because he is su- such an unusual character that you you know you you have to start there I think uh, and there was a chilling piece recently in the Atlantic by Mark Bowden uh, with interviews with several high ranking as in generals uh, uh, military officers who have served directly for Trump in some capacity all anonymous. Um, but they had a lot of scary things to say about Trump's uh, leadership style, and and Bowden uh, came up with sort of a bunch of themes from these uh, discussions that I thought really aligned pretty well with some of the stuff that we talked about. And and I think one of the real contributions of the of the book, and and hat tip to John Glazer who wrote this chapter, um, is is our chapter on Trump's worldview, which I think is a really useful for diagnosing what the heck is going on when you read the paper. So John, maybe you could summarize uh, your take on on Trump's worldview for us. Sure. I do feel obligated to lay out a set of caveats before <laughs> I Such talk about- Such a careful about... scholar. <laughs> yeah, because, because this is a tough... I mean, I was tasked with kind of laying out Trump's worldview and because of a big part of the book is making the distinction between the views and positions of Trump himself and the policies that the administration has actually pursued and carried out. And often those are two distinct things. So it's actually a pretty gargantuan task to look closely very at, grateful at, to you for at doing Trump it, himself. You did an awesome job with it. <laughs> and to try to actually get into his mind and figure out what's driving his rhetoric and ideas and in a way that's useful for the book's analysis. And that's difficult to do for any one person, never mind someone you've never met. So I figured the best way to do it is just kind of clear the slate and look at it very raw. And uh, I found that there were several obstacles. So first, uh, Trump has no political or foreign policy experience. It means he has no formal record of votes or public positions that can help clarify how he thinks about foreign affairs. And since he came in as a political outsider, with frankly a lot of disdain for both Republicans and Democrats, we're not able to just kind of lump him in with a category of comrades that generally share the same policy ideas. Second obstacle is that Trump is a mercurial liar of the highest order. Uh, The political class, including much of the press, had previously been quite apprehensive about just going out and calling things that politicians and especially presidents say as lies. But that changed with Trump because just the avalanche of false statements that was and continues to be just enormous. Uh, So it's hard to determine the worldview of a guy who seemingly cannot tell the truth. The third obstacle is that Trump is an erratic flip-flopper. He's been on many sides of many issues and he changes his position with really a a stunning rapidity. Even in the same day. Even in the same hour. (laughs) Uh, He was in favor of the Iraq war before he was against it. He was in favor of intervening in Libya and overthrowing Gaddafi before he opposed it and criticized Clinton during the campaign for it. Uh, During Obama's presidency, he was strongly opposed to intervention in Syria. Once he was elected, he ramped up the bombing campaign and quadrupled the troop presence. He said NATO was obsolete. Then he became president and said he wasn't obsolete. Um, He allowed a new member to be added under his watch. Exactly. I could go on and on and on. Even below the threshold of actual policy, Trump is not consistent. He wants to crack down on illegal immigration, but he hired countless illegal immigrants in his private business, up to and including after he entered office. He wants to punish companies that send jobs overseas, but he, you know, used cheap foreign labor for many of his own Trump products. Uh, So it's just endless. So again, it's very difficult to determine the worldview of someone who is not consistent about the worldview. Fourth problem, many informed analyses that I came across uh, simply claimed that Trump has no worldview. So he certainly has views. He's not some kind of ideological empty vessel, but he doesn't seem to have a holistic view of how the world works or any kind of coherent framework about foreign affairs and and how the United States should act in that sphere. Uh, And he engages in a lot of ad hoc freelancing and kind of improvisation. And so we should be careful about trying to impose intellectual coherence on that. And finally, I'll make this one very brief. There's good reason to believe that Trump suffers from some cognitive or psychological impairments. And so assuming that he has actually a sort of well-developed theory of the world and America's place in it, is probably a mistake and I'll just leave it at that. So with all those caveats, I came up with four frames that kind of do a decent job of explaining and diagnosing Trump's impulses, his inclinations, and his policies. Um, 
And for that, I really just relied on a compilation of virtually all of Trump's public statements from 1980 to today, as well as his policy statements during the campaign and, and then in his time as office. So four frames. One, zero-sum transactionalism. That's not super new. Uh, many people have noted that about Trump. It shows up in his uh, trade policy. Uh, he, he, doesn't, he seems to believe in a fixed economic pie and trade is the mechanism by which countries fight over that, sh over their share. Uh, that's a misunderstanding of basic economics, but nevertheless, that's his view. Um, he also, uh, this sort of transactionalism and zero sum uh, thing comes up with his, one of his most consistent policy positions, which is allied burden sharing. He doesn't believe that there can be mutually beneficial or even, or even that there should be trade-offs between, um, you know, how much we pay for a po possibly dependent security relationship and maybe the, the strategic gains that we might get from that. I mean, we don't buy that argument, but nevertheless, uh, he focuses on the expense and the unfair uh, burden sharing. And then also, if you think about, this also bleeds into security. So when he was talking about, uh, he, he was insistent on uh, keeping our relationship with Saudi Arabia going, continuing to support the Yemen uh, air campaign. Um, and he even vetoed two efforts by Congress to, to stop that. Um, and w his reasoning was, well, they buy a lot of arms sales from us and it creates jobs. You know, never mind the fact that I think, uh, you know, uh, U.S. jobs tied to arms sales represent less than two tenths of one percent of the labor force. You know, still that's it's a pretty a really, really important two tenths yeah. of one percent. But that that's a pretty starkly transactional view of things that you can sacrifice strategic concerns and humanitarian concerns just because hey, we got this deal and they're buying our arms. Uh, the next frame is Jacksonianism. I won't go into it too much, but if you read uh, Walter Russell Mead's 2001 book, Special Providence, he lays out a typology of different um, traditions in US foreign policy, and one of them is Jacksonian, and it is really uncanny in terms of its a description of, of what President Trump would, would, would become in later years. Um, uh, it's very consistent, and it helps explain you know, his antipathy to international organizations and globalist institutions, quote unquote, his preference for unilateralism, his loosening of the rules of engagement with regard to the bombing campaign against ISIS, his disinclination to actively promote democracy and human rights abroad and so forth. A third frame is- Can I just say, sure. and with no evidence that Pre President Trump had ever read Walter Russell Mead's book, he nevertheless embraced this notion of himself as Jacksonian, putting you know putting a picture of Andrew Jackson famously, I guess, That's in, right. in the Oval Office. So, so Part what, of that was yeah. Bannon. Yeah, Bannon. Bannon right. apparently called Wal Walter Russell Mead on the phone to talk about this Jacksonian typology because he thought it was not only- a good fit for Trump, but but flattering. And Bannon reads, and Trump doesn't. So, but anyways, he yes, uh, Trump has embraced this uh, comparison to to, to Jackson. Um, the third frame is a, is is Trump's fixation on status and reputation. Uh, this has driven many features of his life, his campaign, his presidency. Um, I read this uh, piece by the New York Times' Michael Barbaro, who uh, listened to hours and hours and hours of recorded interviews with Trump that was conducted by his biographer in the early 2000s. And Barbaro said, Trump's deep-seated fear of public embarrassment is his most powerful driving force. The recordings reveal a man who is fixated on his own celebrity and anxious about losing his status. I thought also of when Michael Cohen, Trump's personal fixer and, and lawyer formerly, uh, testified to Congress. Now, now convicted felon. Yeah, now in jail. Uh, uh, he directed Michael Cohen to hire someone to pose as a fake bidder at an art auction that was selling a portrait of Trump. Trump took $60,000 from his charity organization, the Trump Foundation, in order to pay the fake bidder to purchase the portrait of his likeness, all just to make it known that this was in high demand. Yeah, uh, that and, that represents, and, I think, and more tragically, the entire impeachment drama yes. is driven by his attempt to re-litigate and unbesmirch himself 
from the Russia investigation. Right. Yeah, right. so to tease that out a little more, yeah. his main motivation is this basically conspiracy theory that uh, it was not Russia who intervened in the 2016 election. It was actually Ukraine on behalf of Hillary Clinton. So this reversal projection effort is really at the root of his motivation here, and it might become the undoing of his presidency. Um, and it was all an attempt to kind of recoup his his status and his legitimacy as a political uh, figure. Finally, uh, the fourth frame is what I call the authoritarian mind. Uh, Trump has unusually authoritarian inclinations by the standards of contemporary US political culture. He demands loyalty from officials in federal departments that are supposed to be independent and nonpartisan. He's repeatedly attacked federal courts as illegitimate, leveled ad hominem attacks against judges who overrule his executive orders, vilifies the press as the enemy of the people, calls his political opponents traitors, and so on. And political scientists have been studying authoritarian personality traits for decades. And it turns out they tend to share important psychological habits and decision-making styles. And you know they have difficulty engaging in critical thinking. This is part of what um, uh, was in the Bowden article. One of the key quotes from that article, from, from the Bowden Atlantic article is, quote, Trump resents advice and instruction. He likes to be agreed with. Efforts to broaden his understanding irritate him, which gives a sense of what it might be like inside the situation room when they're discussing uh, security issues. Um, and so, you know, the authoritarian types tend to suppress an open and deliberative decision-making process. And so using these four frames, it's turned out to be um, enlightening in terms of uh, making sense out of Trump's foreign policy inclinations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, but one of the things that 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 really puts us right to the puzzle of how can someone that different, let's just say, who espouse such radically critical sort of arguments about UN foreign, U.S. foreign policy on the campaign trail, how come so little? of Trump's foreign policy is actually that much different. Right. So I'll I'll take a stab at this. I think we're all sort of speculating, but one explanation is that the president did not actually hold very strongly to any of the utterances that he made on the campaign trail. John's already alluded to this, that he does not have strongly held opinions. They do change uh, regularly, routinely in response, not to arguments so much as a perception of how it, how it pertains to his reputation and his, his personal prestige. So, so it could just be that he just wasn't all that committed to doing what he said he was going to do. And therefore, when he met any resistance whatsoever, he just sort of relented. Another explanation, which is we at least need to entertain, is the possibility that, that and again, he's alluded to this himself in some of his comments, is that, well, it turns out that it's more complicated than I said it was on the campaign trail. And therefore, some of the things that I said I was going to do, it turns out that I, I can't actually do them. And the first time I think he said this was when, when supposedly Xi Jinping, in the span of about 10 minutes, explained to him in the entire history of China and North Korea relations. Um, and that's when the president said, oh, this is more complicated. He also said it tragically, I think, with respect to the war in Afghanistan, where he was told, where he, he said that no, none of his senior advisors agreed with his desire to withdraw troops from Afghanistan, notwithstanding the opinion of roughly two thirds of Americans who want that longest war to end. Um, the third explanation is sim is a related, but I think somewhat distinct, which is the, the bitter resistance of um, pejoratively the deep state, more accurately, the foreign policy established which is invested in sustaining the status quo, at least as much as they are uh, invested in obeying the orders of the lawfully uh, elected uh, commander in chief. And so again, the Bowden article sort of hints at this, that uh, if people are convinced uh, that, the, that the president's uh, views are not only wrongheaded, but actually dangerous, then they feel an obligation to block uh, his efforts to actually reorient U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, and I think you know that that's you know one one gets a sense that Trump resents that pushback for, and and has been throwing people off the bus the last three years as he sort of you know comes up to one obstacle and then another in human form and gets rid of them and so I think at this point you can see between you know Pompeo and and some others that he has the least resistant 
staff around him at this point that he's had so far in his presidency. And that also explains his preference for having acting secretaries and acting uh, cabinet officials because they are easily replaced and not, again, not confirmed by the Senate, things like that. Let me just say, this is there's a lot of nuance here because I, I have mixed feelings. So on the one hand, I think it's actually really important that since there since Trump was elected uh, and he seemed, you know, I won't go into what I think, but, uh, you know, he, he's a volatile personality and he, and he doesn't know a lot and he's not an expert and he doesn't rely on experts. So in one sense, it's kind of a relief that uh, he is uh, buffered by his administration, his cabinet. I think back to before Trump's uh, summitry with Kim Jong-un, you know, he was engaging in this kind of maximum pressure campaign and threatening war. And he asked the Pentagon for uh, war plans and Mattis slow walked them. I mean, he deliberately slow walked these plans getting to the White House because he knew such a war would be catastrophic, dangerous, not in US interests, et cetera. But he also understood that this volatile president needed to be carried a little more than most presidents. On the other hand, it's a very real problem if the president's wishes are not being carried out by uh, people that are supposed to be subordinate to him. So for example, on uh, Syria, uh, about a year ago or maybe six months ago, uh, Trump, as he is wont to do outside the interagency process, tweeted a declaration that he wants all US troops removed from Syria. That was essentially reversed by the bureaucracy through a lot of bureaucratic infighting and a lot of uh, resistance within his own cabinet. That announcement, that declaration, that decision was walked back to the point where Trump had to essentially agree to an indefinite presence of about a thousand uh, troops in Syria. And that has just recently replayed itself. Trump once again uh, announced a partial withdrawal really from just a specific area along the Syria-Turkey border. Um, and there was enormous uproar both in Congress and including among Republicans, but also in his own cabinet. Um, and there, I th it seems to be, you know, working itself. The time that Trump, you know, makes a statement on Twitter to the time policy gets implemented, implemented it becomes modified and more consistent with the preferences of the of the bureaucracy. And and I'm I'm with you, but let me let's take that even to another level. So, I I agree. In a well functioning system, the head of the executive branch's instructions should be followed. But to me, if you know, in our chapter about continuity and change, one of the um, you know one of the things you realize about when you look at what's changed the most, you look at trade, you look at immigration, you look at some of these things. The places where Trump's made the most America first like changes are the places where the president has the freest hand, right? And that includes military intervention and the movement of, of US forces. And where he has more trouble are, are, are places where either Congress, the courts, or or the bureaucracy have kind of a, a bigger role to play in making things happen. Where Can I add to that? I think where he has the freest hand and also where he exhibits the most sort of commitment, Absolutely. personal commitment Absolutely. to trade and immigration. Because clearly he met resistance within the Administer within the bureaucracy to those policies as well, Absolutely. but he was willing to right. plow right through right. those objections. And, and so, th so that's a perfect sort of twin pillar. So he, you know, the imperial presidency is is a is a big kind of overarching concern for this building, and and you know I think we can be grateful it hasn't we haven't seen more of it. Um, but to me, the idea that that. Trump should be in a position where you have to be upset that he's not being obeyed. Like he has no, there's, well, how should the president be able to send troops willy nilly to Syria without some kind of public debate and authorization? That he shouldn't, we shouldn't be having that conversation, John, because there shouldn't be any US troops in Syria. That's fair enough. I, this is my frustration with particularly Republicans in Congress, but Congress in general, both Democrats and Republicans, and their uproar over Trump's announcement to withdraw. Actually, not. It's just move troops from one relocate. area to the other. Yeah, yeah. relocate inside Syria. Uh, is if they really care that much about keeping troops in Syria, they can always vote on an AUMF authorizing a U.S. presence there. 
But there is no AUMF authorizing. There's no congressional authority whatsoever for our presence there. So it's illegal. Absolutely. And, and, you know, we talk about this in the book, too, that, you know, over decades, Congress has abdicated chunk after chunk of foreign policy, of of the authority and role it had, whether it was trade or other things. And they said, hey, let's give the president fast track and negotiating authority. And then that comes back to bite you in the butt. Like historically, folks, the reason we want separation of powers is because, you know, all of history shows that when you give one person too much power, very bad things happen. And we're just, the chickens are coming home to roost. During the Cold War, all those problems with that approach are 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 muddled and obscured because everyone kind of agrees on the right thing to That's do. Right, yeah. But once you stop agreeing, this is when you realize, I can't, we can't do it like this anymore. No one wants, n- neither team wants the other team to have that power. It's too, it's too terrible. And if I'm being overly optimistic, that may be one of the silver linings of the Trump presidency, because I think he has in part persuaded even strong advocates of the imperial presidency, of expansive executive powers that, you know, uh, to f- for the president to uh, handle those powers responsibly, you need a responsible president. And that's not a guarantee in a democracy. All right. So that's a good pivot to the next question, which is, let's, you know, just good Lord willing, imagine that there's only one Trump term and and someone else gets a chance next, whoever that might be. Um, what lasting impacts does this four years have on U.S. foreign policy moving forward? Well, one thing I have expected, and frankly, I expected this once Donald Trump secured the nomination in the summer of 2016. Again, the chance there was a 50-50 chance that someone like Donald Trump might become president of the United States, I thought might prompt uh, especially U.S. treaty allies in Europe and Asia to rethink their their level of dependence upon the United States for their security and perhaps hedge a little bit. Um, there's been precious little evidence of that hedging. And what we've seen instead is um, a determination to either curry favor with him. You see how, how uh, particularly uh, Shinzo Abe in Japan has done this. Uh, some uh, European leaders, others, of course, have sort of reveled in their <laughs> resistance and 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 uh, uh, stronger towards Trump, um, but I think what you see instead is a is sort of waiting him out and sort of expecting that he's a one term presidency. Presidency. I just find that to be incredibly irresponsible on the part of these countries. I mean, the the political process in the United States has demonstrated that uh, the level of commitment of uh, the American people to this notion of the United States providing security for others for free um, is is not very durable. And so someone else could come along and actually implement the policy that candidate Donald Trump claimed that he was going to implement. If I were a leader in pick a place that's a U.S. treaty ally or even not a U.S. treaty ally, if I was expecting the United States of America to protect me from harm, then I would expect to be voted out of office because that's an extraordinarily irresponsible thing to do. We haven't seen that kind of response so far in part because I think they're just hoping against hope uh, that this is all just a bad dream and he's going to go away and then we'll go back to the way it was before. So it's interesting. It's a very mixed bag, I think. Um, On the one hand, so for example, on, you know, Trump's obsequiousness towards uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel as our core Middle East partners uh, has started to uh, make those relationships almost partisan in nature. And the backlash, particularly on Saudi Arabia, in the face of what's going on in Yemen and in the face of the mur- murder of Jamal Khashoggi uh, has, I think, opened up the possibility that a future president will decide that we need to alter these relationships. Just because Trump has been so firmly in their favor that it's led to excesses. Like for example, Israel's uh, official sort of claiming of the Golan Heights and so on. Uh, uh, and. And on the other hand, you know, North Korea, I think it's going to be hard for anyone, even a hawk, if if one were to replace Trump, to uh, go back to a policy of, you know, isolation and ratcheting up the pressure. There is now a relationship with North Korea. I don't think it's the diplomacy is being handled that well by the Trump administration, but there is a relationship and that can be built on by a future president. 
Um, things that I'm worried about are react. So if if there's a reaction against Trump that goes too far in the other direction, we'll be in trouble. So Trump's emphasis on allied burden sharing now has the taint of Trump, and it might create a more vigorous um, uh, embrace of adding more allies to our, uh, our our treaty obligations. Also on Russia. So Trump is doesn't see Russia as a threat. And of course, he, he many people think he's obsequious towards President Putin. And that might result in a more hawkish policy towards Russia just to kind of, uh, as they might see it, set the record straight about what US policy is. Trevor, hasn't some of your polling or looking at the polls hinted at a reverse Trump effect, especially among young people with respect to this question about alliances and burden sharing? Yeah, no, it's very interesting. There's at this point a fairly well-documented Trump boomerang um, where, you know, Republicans have kind of started to follow him. And I think that's, you know, one of the important long-term implications for the GOP is that Trump may have broken their foreign policy permanently. Or the party. And yeah. the party. Um, but on the Democratic side, it's really started to give a lot of momentum to the progressive sort of wing of of the Democratic Party um, and, and, and has boosted in sort of across the board Democratic support for free trade. Anything they sense Trump is for they're against anything he's against they're for so they're now you know more supportive of free trade than ever more supportive of the allies than ever and that's not real um, but it's it's but the the possibility that that political leaders take those numbers and go aha let's run with those <laughs> is real because that's what they love that's what they love to do so one other thing that i would add the big key foreign policy question i think for the future of us foreign policy is china and it is going to be very very difficult to unwind the damage Trump has done to the US-China relationship. Uh, he's he's uh, you know engaging in a trade war with them. Uh, he's uh, changed the US approach in many ways. And I think you've you've created uh, a political class in in China, or at least you've at the very least reinforced the views in China that say, the United States is an enemy or will be, and we need to be on on the watch for them trying to contain us or uh, halt our rise and so on. Uh, that has been more firmed up, I think, over there and over here. Uh, and and so I'm, I'm deeply troubled about uh, the future of US-China policy. All right. If you were advising whoever Trump's opponent is in 2020, what would you tell him? What, what kind of foreign policy does the US need now? I think that the the United States, uh, given our physical security, our prosperity, and our commitment to limited constitutional government to the extent that, that we do have it, um, is much better served by a foreign policy that interacts with the rest of the world, mostly through trade and cultural exchange and diplomacy, and less by the use of military force. Um, that is not President Trump's approach. And so if if you are a candidate trying to draw clear distinctions between yourself and him, that is where I would really focus the effort. Um, the United States uh, has, has benefited enormously from um, uh, cultural exchange uh, and trade uh, and sort of making that case as often as possible, while at the same time criticizing uh, the conduct of U.S. foreign policy when it's, when it's mostly military in nature, I think you're really pushing on an open door. I think there are a lot of Americans who are receptive to the argument that, gee, these wars that we've been fighting since at least 9-11 haven't seemed to work out very well. Maybe we should try something different. And, and again, tragically, I think President Trump said maybe we should try something different and in critical respects either continued doing the wrong stupid stuff or or chose to do the wrong different things. Either case, it was a disaster. Uh, and, and I think there's a real opportunity for someone to call attention to how he or she would do things differently. I think uh, the candidate challenging Trump uh, needs to counteract the do something bias in US politics and US foreign policy. There is a strong bias to act and do affirmative things um, 
even when they might not be justified, even when they might not be necessary for U.S. security. Um, and th those those actions tend to be military in nature, uh, just because we have such a big military and it's overused as it is. And so we kind of frame foreign policy problems in strictly military terms. It's going to be very tough though uh, for sort of looking ahead because power held tends to be power wielded. Uh, you know, it's very, very ahistorical to expect uh, the world's most powerful nation to not uh, exercise that power. We have a lot of capability, a lot of capacity. And if you're trying to retrench a bit, which we, we advocate in the book, sort of pull back US uh, militarism, US commitments, um, you know, adopt a set of national interests that are, are more narrow and, and more modest than, than the current set, uh, it's very hard to turn that ship of state into an entirely different direction because again, we're so, so powerful and uh, we have such a, a unique sort of role in the world uh, over the last 70 plus years. Uh, that's very hard to undo. And it's very hard for an incoming president who's about to be enthroned with all of that, uh, <laughs> uh, with all of that power to ask them to not exercise it. That takes a certain kind of person uh, and, and a lot of self-restraint. And I don't know, I don't know if we'll get that. And not the kind of person, candidly, who runs for office to be president of the United States. Yeah. Um, you know. I'm reminded of, of Gandalf who said that he would try to use the ring for good, but through me, it would do great evil. Uh, maybe the presidency is, is like the one ring. <laughs> All right. On that note, guys, thanks for a fantastic conversation. <laughs> it's a great book, folks. Uh, get it on Amazon. Uh, Google us on Cato. Look at our fantastic webpage uh, dedicated to the book. Uh, thanks to our producers, uh, Cecil Sherman and Louis Abrigo, and to everyone for listening. To continue the conversation on Twitter, uh, you can find us at, at Power Problems. And if you like the show, please leave us a good review on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts.